You're on. Awesome. Welcome Friday Night Wine Adventurers to SIP episode 41. Uh, I am going to let some of the folks gather into the chat room, if you will. I see quite a few people already there. Debbie Long, happy Friday. Gene Golden, happy Friday. Jeff and Jane Greasy, happy 41 consecutive Fridays in a row. They are outside of Denise and I, the two longest running attendees of the entire program. Kim Vance, winemaker, love to see it. How are you, Jim. young lady? Yep. Uh, Jim Brubaker from Colorado, Mark Chalinar, Nick Schramm in Chicago, Peter Glick, thank you for the introduction this past week. Looking forward to some dialogue there. Doug Rutherford up in Minnesota, don't know what the temp is up there, Doug. I, I hope it's uh, I hope it's nice. I know Minnesota in January is not exactly TripAdvisor hot destination, but I know you're making do. Hans and Caitlin Greasy from Colorado. We're gonna give it a minute right now just because we're not going live on Facebook this week. We're actually gonna go live on YouTube. So there's some troubleshooting behind the scenes, but wanna welcome everybody. And while I have your attention, uh, I just wanna thank you all for not only coming tonight, but really participating with Cellar Angels as a whole. You are building the greatest wine community in the United States. We are uh, thrilled to be the facilitator of that. And we have heard you. Uh, we've got some special announcements tonight because uh, you have mentioned some things that you want us to do and we're gonna be doing them. So let me get to that right straight away. Uh, if you have a glass of wine in front of you, and I know most of you do, Barb Randall, how are you doing? Carrie Schuster's on. We actually just spoke to Carrie to help troubleshoot some of the technical difficulties. Chad Angelo, your name is gonna be coming up later on. Hello to Chad. Uh, I wanna show some folks exactly what we're talking about when we talk about some special announcements coming up. So you can see the the wine page on Cellar Angels. Also, you see the SIP virtual tasting kit. Now that's not new, but what's new going forward is we're gonna be having some educational tastings where you're gonna get multiple bottles. So you'll have to open up two bottles at the same time for your SIP tasting because we're gonna be doing some comparisons. We're gonna be doing all sorts of deep dive educational things as it relates to terroir, AVA, varietal, and you're gonna to have to open up two bottles. But we have something for you in that capacity because in your SIP kit, very shortly, you will be able to get a special closure system to be able to have two bottles open. And it's going to be this little wonderful scientific device called Report. That's on us. We're going to be giving that to you. Uh, you will be able to open up a bottle, have a glass, do the comparison with us, and then put this right in the bottle. It'll save the wine. You can have another glass the next night. You can have another glass the next night. And it will actually preserve the wine from a technological little invention that they have. Not as expensive as a Coravin, mind you, uh, because what is, quite honestly. Uh, so this is going to be in your SIP kits, and we're looking forward to that. Also coming up, we are launching, don't wait for it next week. It's not going to be out yet, but a loyalty club. And, and there's going to be ways, think of Think of the airlines as it relates to loyalty clubs, but we're not gonna make you travel 100,000 miles to finally get some uh, respect. You are gonna get it right from the word go. Loyalty clubs are coming because we wanna honor the wine community. Speaking of clubs, everyone that's in the library club, you know you've got a special event coming up later uh, this month with Cliff Family Wines. And it is gonna be something that we're gonna be doing more and more often. Uh, but tonight I wanna get to the guest and feature of the hour. Uh, we're gonna be focused a little bit on Merlot this evening, but more importantly, the people that are crafting the Merlot and the people behind the scenes. And they've had quite a few features on Cellar Angels over the last seven or so years. And every single time we get feedback from people saying, I have never heard of this wine and it absolutely blew me away. And the people behind Grayscale Wines are with us this evening. And I would love to introduce everyone to Larry and Jean Rowe from Grayscale. Cheers, you guys. Cheers, everyone. Howdy. Thank you for having us, Martin. Oh, my goodness, my, my pleasure. And I, I think it's fantastic to be focused on a Merlot. And it's, it's interesting because we always talk about the king and queen in Napa and Sonoma, and specifically Napa uh, with Cabernet Sauvignon and Chardonnay. And Merlot seems to is, and I don't know why, it seems to oftentimes be second fiddle or redheaded stepchild or whatever it may be, but it's actually one of the most sought after wines in the world. And you guys make one that's just absolutely out of the world. So, so how did, and who, either one of you can take this, what drew you initially to Merlot and why? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, 
actually, we've we've always enjoyed Merlot. I know it got a, a terrible rap with the movie Sideways, but we've always enjoyed it. It's it's kind of a softer, uh, gentler cab, if you will, a little more versatile in terms of um, enjoying with food, um, a little more accessible for most most wine drinkers as well because the of the softer tannins and whatnot. So. We've always enjoyed it, even though it, it kind of got a bad rap there for a while. And I know we'll, we'll get into a little bit deeper dive on the Merlot, but was there a, was there a Merlot moment, an epiphany where you're like, wow, what is this? Anything striking? No, we, we, had, we knew about Merlot and we, were, we, we started with a cab and, a, and a, uh, essentially a Bordeaux Blanc, uh, which we call Coupe Blanc, we'll talk about more later. And we, we got to the point where we wanted to add a third, a third product. And we were looking at a red because they seem to sell better. And, and so uh, we talked about a lot of things. And in the end, we settled on the Merlot. And particularly after we'd done a bunch of studies, both marketing studies and, and uh, uh, kind of looked at other products in the marketplace, we thought we would be able to produce a, co a pretty good Merlot that would sell. And, and boy, we hit, we hit a home run. Um, oh, that's awesome. And successful. The, it's interesting because people, we, we do get a lot of feedback and they said, I've never heard of this wine, winery before. How do you guys find these, which is our known secret, but tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about the backstory. I think uh, the year was 2009 when you found it, but the love and adoration of, no, not 2009. Okay. You tell me. <laughs> well, um, our you know, that story starts with a memorable trip for us to Bordeaux in 2005, um, where we were lucky enough to visit most of the uh, Premier Grand Cru wineries um, on the left bank. Ironically, there's kind of a side story there because our first trip was to Oprion, and they served this beautiful white wine before, before our tour. And I said to Larry, I said, man, this is really good. I've never had anything like this. Um, I think we need some. And it turns out it was my first experience with a Bordeaux Blanc. And Larry laughs and he goes, okay, dear, um, I just want to let you know that it's $300 a bottle. Um, but anyway, to, the reason I bring that up is that's what, that's what we modeled our white wine after. So, so Jean said, okay, I'll take six instead of 12. Uh, yeah, <laughs> kind of like that. Um, but anyway, no, that's... But go ahead story forward, um, we came back from that trip in totally in love with Bordeaux wines, you know, the old style um, cab Merlot based wines. And so um, just so happened that we were having a very big birth, uh, anniversary the next year, 2006. And there was a company called Crushpad over in the city, mm -hmm. uh, San Francisco, that um, yep. would make custom barrels for customers. So we thought for our Mm -mm, wedding anniversary. Um, let's make a barrel of wine with crush bed. And so lo and behold, we did. We met our, our winemaker who is still our winemaker today. And that, we made- how, how, did you, how did you meet him? He, he was assigned to us. He was assigned not, to us, yeah. Um, because <laughs> we were making uh, Napa cabs and he was the Napa cab guy. Um, so anyway, um, we made that barrel, had a lot of fun with it, uh, had great response to it from our friends. And so, um, but we couldn't sell it. Um, so we weren't licensed to sell at that point. So then 2008 came around and we said, well, maybe we should do this for real. And so lo and behold, Grayscale was born. Um, and the, the trip to Bordeaux in 2005, I think you mentioned, was that, uh, first time there, follow-up trip? First time. First time for us. Not to France, but to Bordeaux. Awesome. Um, and and how long, and I'm only asking this because the angels have got some plans brewing in the future, but I'm curious, how long were you there? A week. It's a one-week tour, and, and it was pretty expensive, but it, it guaranteed you went to, uh, they wanted to go to all five of the, of the uh, first growths, but it turns right. Lafitte was closed because this trip was in the first week of September. And that's about when Crush started. And in fact, our, as Jeannie said, our first day was at Oprion. And during that day, like at 10 or, uh, 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning, uh, the first uh, grapes came in from the vineyard for the, 
for the crush for uh, 2005. You kind of like that 10 a.m. They're handing you a glass of uh, Blanc and you just have to get after it. <laughs> Somebody had to do it. So yeah, that's right. You know, when in France, uh, <laughs> if I haven't said hello to Jean Golden, Julie Fogarty, thank you so much for joining Kate Jurica. Uh, I did see Scotland Kiefer's in the house. Stephen uh, Meyer, how are you guys doing? Happy belated New Year to everyone. And now, Larry, you also have an interesting background because this technology of video broadcasting is not foreign to you. Uh, in fact, I think even if I took everybody on the Zoom session right now and combined all of their Zoom chats for the last year together, you probably have more video broadcast than everyone put together over the span of your career. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about your career and when you first decided that, okay, Maybe when I'm drinking for alcohol, I need to evolve a little bit and, and expand my horizon. Well, I was always a great fan of wine. And, and you, gotta, you gotta understand there's two sides to this story. There's my side and there's Jeannie's side. Uh, oh, we're gonna get to Jeannie's side. Okay, well, so for me, it was, uh, we got married. We, were, we enjoyed going wine tasting. We had done that for, for many years. Uh, we bought a lot of wines, we drank a lot of wine. And so that was just kind of one of the things. Uh, I actually retired from the university in 2003. And so I did- Which, which university? Uh, I taught at Berkeley in computer science. And uh, in answer to the, to the query, I, I was doing webcasting back in 1993 uh, worldwide on the internet. And eventually we did a webcasting system at Berkeley that broadcast, uh, it was about 500 classes a, a semester. Uh, so it was, it was, it was pretty big. Um, so Jeannie and I were looking for things to do and, and uh, we both wanted to go someplace other than, than wineries in the West Coast. I mean, we'd been to, we'd been to a lot in California. We'd been up, uh, I think we'd been up to Oregon and Washington by that time, maybe not. Um, nice. So we were, we were interested in trying something else. And so we said, let's go to Bordeaux because we found this tour and the, the availability of the tour made a big difference. And then subsequent to that, we continued to go on other tours, but we'd done the barrel and we kind of got the bug. And uh, uh, so, it, you know, the real story is that doing a, a barrel by yourself, you don't drink 25 cases of wine a, a year. And so if you want to make some next year, you gotta, you gotta get rid of it somewhere else. And so, the obvious thing is be in the business and sell it to other people. And so that's kind of how we, we decided to do that. That is fascinating. So you were at Crushpad and we have actually filmed some videos at Crushpad over the years for Cellar Angels. So it's fantastic. So you were there and you signed up for a program to say, let's make a barrel of wine. And they assigned you Keenan. 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 Yeah, K-I-A-N. Uh, and for those of you that are longtime Cellar Angels loyalists, uh, you know Chad Angelo is on this evening. Uh, he's the winemaker for Angelo Cellars, Mario Bazan. Uh, and he has, an, uh, heck, you guys can do a story better than I can. When, when he walked up and you were assigned to him, did you know who he was? No. No. Knew nothing. <laughs> Except for we knew he had French heritage. And we thought, oh, we want to make kind of an old world, yeah. old world Napa cab. We thought, oh, he's our guy. And then lo and behold, he has quite a, a nice resume. And, and he came from Davis and, and he was clearly a pro. And, right. And so we were perfectly happy. And after the first year, it was pretty apparent, you know, he was the guy we wanted to work with. So when we started the commercial venture, he was the winemaker at the same time. So, um, and, then, and then other things happen. And in fact, there are many people that you've had on, on Cellar Angels that, that uh, either worked at or went through uh, Crush Pad, including Cindy. Uh, yep. And Chad. Uh, and Chad. Yeah, that's right. Uh, from Passaggio and Kim Vance, winemaker from Zoetic, is actually on tonight, and she made the introduction seven or eight years ago or so. Right. Thank you, Kim. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and it, it's another testament to everything that we always say at Cellar Angels: great wine brings people together, and this is another perfect example of that. I am going to launch our first poll question, just because it has to do with. Uh, what we are drinking right now, or many of us are drinking uh, with the Merlot. So for those of you, and by the way, since we're not broadcasting on Facebook any longer, which is great, 
we can now put more than three answers in. So which of the below tasting notes, and many of you have gone through formal wine tasting education, which of the below tasting notes examples best describes Merlot? So now, Gene and Larry, you guys can answer to yourself, but obviously you can't vote. Uh, I see a bunch of answers coming in. Uh, Nelson Holden is in Duluth. Hello, Nelson. Duluth in January has never been described as balmy. That I can promise you. Uh, gonna give this about 10 more seconds. Answers are going all over the board. And I think this is a good description. So, and it's funny because people say, well, tell me about Merlot. And we used to get that question a lot when Denise and I owned the wine store is, I don't know anything about Merlot. So five, four, three, two, one. Gene and Larry, you, you wanna um, take a guess if you had to answer? That's interesting. I, I, it was funny, I was just telling Larry, I would answer maybe three out of the four. I yeah, the, the, the number one answer from a, from a tasting description standpoint, and this isn't uh, Martin's definition, this was Decanter magazine, but uh, Merlot is most often described as full with cassis fruit. <laughs> what I was saying. <laughs> so, so when you think Cabernet being, you know, the power and the finesse, and Merlot has that just it's full body, Gene, to your point earlier, it's kind of like a softer, more elegant uh, Cabernet. It just doesn't have that, that oomph, like you will, but it does have that mesmerizing uh, cassis fruit and, and the uh, bouquet and the aromatics, and it does still have that, that full body, which is just fantastic. So, Gene, let's, let's talk a little bit about your story, because it really is uh, kind of part and parcel to your fondness for wine. And, and so tell me a little bit about kind of how you grew up. Well, you know, when, uh, when we did start the winery, people kind of said, what are, you, what are you doing that for? And it really wasn't that far a stretch for us because my dad, um, growing up in the San Francisco East Bay, my dad grew grapes and made wine in the 70s. And that was kind of an interesting story in itself because during in the 70s in the uh, East Bay, there was quite a home winemaking um, revolution, if you will. And it, the center point where all the guys would go to get, get their knowledge and get their supplies was this place called Wine and the People in Berkeley. Is that perfect? And <laughs> it's very Berkeley. Very Berkeley. And so, but that was kind of the focal point for a lot of the home winemaking activities. So, um, and he caught the bug. He was taking classes up in Davis. Um, he had tr trouble growing his grapes to the desired sugar levels um, he, during, with his location, but he would buy grapes from from um, from Napa and make wine. And so we, we kind of, we've been doing this for a long time. So um, none of this was, um, you know, all that new, but on the same, on the same uh, note, we, we lived 40 minutes from Napa. And so we were up there all the time, uh, taking classes, tasting wine, whatever. So wine was a major part of our life growing up. No, that I like. And it's funny, we, we, I'm fascinated with Merlot because of the, over the last, uh, maybe the last 15 years, not so much, but from 19, in my opinion, from about 1980 to 2000, Merlot was synonymous commercially with Duckhorn. It, it, it seemed that uh, Duckhorn was the Merlot and it was, and, and, and you know, hats off to them. They, they did make a great Merlot. It was on a lot of restaurant menus over the years and that sort of thing. But it was, it's interesting, the most expensive wine in the world on, in Palmerol, Chateau Petrus is actually always 90 plus percent Merlot base. Chateau Cheval Blanc is heavy Merlot. They've got, I think, 42 separate hect or vineyard blocks of Merlot. It's just an amazing grape. And I was surprised to learn uh, Tenuta de Ornanaya, uh, the great, uh, you know, Frescobaldi property. They're 100% Merlot uh, out of uh, the Tuscany region. And so I would love to see Merlot gain commercially, uh, you know, and you, Gene, you referenced it earlier, uh, the, the impact of, of Sideways in 2004. 
uh, from a commercial standpoint. And it's kind of funny, Nelson, did it not go sideways during that time? It did go sideways during that time. And, and you guys can probably attest to the, the growers, if you will, or the wineries that all around, up and down the coast of California or winemaking region were tearing out Merlot vineyards and planting Pinot Noir and, and the insanity of that. Uh, so, so how do we how do we commercially get people into Merlot in a big, big fashion? And I think this is a very important first step, by the way, yeah. the grayscale. Yeah. Go ahead. So we had we had uh, we decided we'd settled on doing Merlot, and of course the big the big problem was everybody knows people won't buy Merlot, and so we wanted to make a Merlot that was a more serious wine. Uh, the Duckhorn people had done have done a lot of really great wines. Uh, but we thought we could do something that would be a little different, a little bit less expensive. And so we, we did it and we took it to pour and we started pouring. And every time we poured at events, half the people would come up at the table and they'd, they'd say, okay, we like your white uh, Merlot. I don't want a Merlot. Let me taste the cab. And we'd say, no, 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 you got to try the Merlot. And they said, why? And if you just try it, see if you would like it or not. And they go, no, I don't like Merlot. I don't do Merlot. I don't do Merlot. You know, it's like just about everybody coming to the table. Well, sure enough, they take the wine, they taste it, and they, they all of a sudden their eyes would kind of go, it's like, oh, this is a really good wine. Why is, why is it I don't know about it? And, yep. and it was really the effect of that movie and the impact it had on the marketplace that it just kind of wiped it out. And, yep. and, then, and then we went to Solvang to pour at an event. And Jeannie says to me, as we're getting ready to go, Gosh, should we take our Merlot? You know, those people down there are probably going to hate Merlot. Because that was the uh, the location. site of the the location of the sideways. Right. Yeah. So I thought, oh my God, we're going into the sideways world, and they won't they won't want to come to our table. Yeah, the the sideways echo chamber for anti Merlot. <laughs> they said, no, we love Merlot. So anyway. Well, and, and Doug Rutherford, who's uh, quite a wine collector in Minnesota, is, is writing that he had the Ed Sabrasia 1994 Behringer Hollow Mountain Merlot, and it was one of his favorite wines of all time. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Neat. Mm -hmm. uh, and Ed Sabrasia makes quite a few good wines, so that's quite a statement. And so what happened at the event down in Solding? Oh, we sold mostly Merlot, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was, it, it, no, it was a great event. No, we loved going down there. Um, yeah, it's the insanity of trying to figure out the commercial palette. Yeah. It, it, uh, it's, it's never ending. So now tell me about, in addition to the Merlot, you, you've talked about kind of a Bordeaux Blanc. Uh, tell me about the portfolio. So we have three wines. Uh, we have the Bordeaux Blanc, which we call Cuvée Blanc, because as with Champagne, you can't use the word Bordeaux in the title. And it's a partially oak barrel fermented Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and part of it is, is is stainless steel fermented. The stainless steel gives you the, the citrus, the, the uh, barrel fermentation gives you stone fruits. We mix those together and then we put in a little bit of semillon at the end to kind of give it a little weight and, and some gravitas. And uh, it was really made primarily as, as a Bordeaux Blanc. And the thing that was funny is that we got, we decided to do it, the reason everybody does who gets into the business we were talking to Kian and, say, and we said, okay, we're gonna do the cab. And, and it was gonna be two or three years before we had a product. We said, well, what else can we do? And he said, well, what about a white? He said, we could do a Chardonnay. And we kind of said, yeah, we're not, we're not real interested in doing a Chardonnay. And he we said- We don't do Chardonnay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he, uh, he kept saying, well, what is it you like? And, and, I, and, I, and we said, well, we love those Bordeaux Blancs. And he about jumped out of his shoes being French, number one, he knew that cold. Number two, when he was at Claude of All, he actually made a Bordeaux Blanc for Claude of All. And so he absolutely knew how to do it. He was real excited about doing it. And so we did it and it's, it's, it's been a very good, it's been a great wine and real successful. No, it's a fantastic wine. And I wish you, either one of you, uh, talk a little bit more about Kian because uh, his background, because when you say he was assigned to you, I think a, a halfway decent analogy would be something similar to say, I would like to start an NFL team. And the first person that walks up to you says, hi, I'm Peyton Manning. I would like to help you with your <laughs> NFL team to be your quarterback. Sure. Well, uh, Kian, uh, he got a, a degree in, I think it was genetics uh, at Davis, but he was in the winemaking program. Uh, as Jeannie said, he's French. 
uh, the family name is actually is actually Iranian, but but his grandparents or great grandparents, I think, moved to France and were growing things and whatever. And then then the family came to the United States, and so Kian went to Davis and got a got the winemaker, you know, became a winemaker. Uh, and the thing that I really enjoy is he, I mean, like any well-educated University of California student, yeah, uh, he has not only the theory and the understanding of what is happening, he has the practice of how it actually does happen. And so uh, he went from school, the first thing they all do is they go fly and, and uh, work at wineries at different places around the world. He of course went back to France and worked at, um, I think it's, uh, uh, um, yeah, I forget the name of the, the place. And then he came out here and he worked in the lab at uh, Opus uh, for, a, for a while, and then he went to uh, Clos de Val and, and eventually grew to be the assistant winemaker at Clos de Val responsible for the reserve program, which is very important because they were using fruit from a vineyard in Rutherford, uh, which today is known as George III. And ah. that, happened, that happens to be the vineyard that, that we and many other people in the co-op uh, actually use for our Cabernet uh, product. And there's a whole story about this Beckstoffer stuff, and we can get into that at some point if you want. Uh, and then he went to work for Crushpad. And the interesting thing about Crushpad is that he got to make probably 100 or 150 wines a year with fruit from 20 or 30, probably more than that, vineyards right. in Napa, Sonoma, and, and Northern California. And it was a tremendously educational opportunity for him. And he and I have talked about the fact that it was kind of, a, it helped him understand so much more about what things are possible and how they work and different vineyards and things like that. It was really a growth thing for him. And then he and one of the executives spun out of uh, Crushpad and formed a, a co-op called Keto. And Chad was one of the original members of Keto. Uh, and there, there are several others that, that uh, were uh, uh, Gene Edwards and, and some others. And so we all are part of that co-op, uh, sharing facilities, sharing purchasing of grapes and the like. No, that's that's fantastic. And it is quite a matriculation to go from Davis all, all the way back to Europe, then to Opus, then to Clodoval, and then now, I mean, it's very special type of individual to be able to have both the classroom, if you will, and also the in the dirt vineyard experience and then be able to combine the two over 15, 20, 20 some odd years. That's extra special. And I think it actually is what elevates brands and certainly elevates folks that are working with a quote unquote rock star like that. Uh, so congratulations on having that relationship. I think it's a quite a testament to the two of you because I, I love the part where he was assigned to you. <laughs> and I know, isn't that terrible? <laughs> it's like we did, we had no well, idea. I take a, it's I like, where, I, am I, where are my parolees? We're over here. All right, I've been assigned to you. I'll take a slightly different viewpoint. If he hadn't done a good job, we would not still be with yeah, him. Exactly. <laughs> well, that's good. But you also have to like the people you work with. And clearly it's been a long time. So, so that's good. And by the way, the vineyard behind me is actually the vineyard source for the Merlot. Uh, we're going to show that this was actually from our drone footage that we took a snapshot of when we did the video with you. Uh, I'll show folks where that is in a, in a second. Uh, but I'm, I want to talk a little bit because you just mentioned Cabernet Sauvignon and just for the next 48 hours and just only for Cellar Angels, Gene and Larry have been kind enough to make their Cabernet Sauvignon available to Cellar Angels and it's on the website tonight. So we just put it on the website. It is a rock star of a Cabernet Sauvignon as you can imagine, because of the story that you just heard about the winemaker. Uh, in addition to the Merlot, the Cabernet Sauvignon is right here and there is only 36 bottles. Uh, so that is all that is allocated to us. So hopefully that gets gone this evening or over the weekend, but this is quite a dynamic duo, the, the Merlot and the Cabernet. So Gene and Larry, thank you so much for giving that to the angels. Uh, for the next 48 hours. That's very special. I want to see if, I, I know there's going to be a couple of questions later on, but if anybody has any questions about um, the philosophy 
I don't know anything about your philosophy, the two of you on aging. I do know you have some amazing age worthy wines. Uh, and I think it just has to do with how they're made, but tell me a little bit about your barrel and aging philosophy and, and where you picked up that desire and, and how you kind of put that in the practice. Well, I, I mean, we've done a lot, a lot of reading, a lot of talking. We visit a lot of different wineries and talk to winemakers. In fact, I can tell you many times, Chad and I have, have sat around and yacked about this stuff and him, we see her all the time and we're always comparing notes. Um, the thing is originally we came from Bordeaux and it was like, everything has to be hundred percent new French oak. And so when we did the private barrel, I said, I want hundred percent new French oak, which we got and it was great. But what happened when we went commercial is we started to realize there was a little bit too much oak. And so mm -hmm. we started to dial back how much new oak we have. And I think now we're running somewhere between 40 and 60% new oak each year. Uh, and then we have one used barrels uh, the other year. And both, both the Merlot and the Cab are, are, um, um, are aged in barrel for roughly 20, 22 months, depending on a bunch of little inconsequential things. Um, and then we age the uh, Cab in the bottle for a year to two years until it's ready to go. And the, the Merlot, it's about six or seven months that we, we age it in the bottle before it, before it goes. And in, interestingly enough, we do not use any new French oak in the, the Merlot. And the reason for that is Merlot is more, is, a, is not as strong a grape and you don't want to overpower it with the, with the oak. And so we actually use once used barrels on the, uh, uh, on the Merlot. Very nice. And I, I agree with you. It's kind of funny because uh, the production studio just whispered in my ear the same thing. They do not like Merlot that are overly oaked and you can tell they haven't, they, it's either new French oak or it's, it's just way too long because it's just, you, all you taste is the oak and not the fruit. Yeah. So uh, how do you decide where to source your wines from? Um, we talk with Ken a lot and he, he know, I mean, we've been working for what, 15 years now. So I think he, he knows our style, he knows our palates. Um, but he, he has his pulse on, on the vineyards in the, in the valley. We want to stay in Napa Valley. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we work directly with him and, and use, uh, his knowledge and background as a resource quite a bit. Um, we, surprisingly enough, we haven't shift vineyards very much though. So, um, we've been, our cab has been coming from the George III vineyard since 2012. And, um, so um, the Merlot, when we started in 2014, we've been using the Orchard, uh, Orchard Vineyard in the Oak Knoll District um, for all those, all those years. And we're using um, those for our current vintages as well. Um, so it's a, um, we're looking for um, uh, more of an old style wine, um, not kind of um, over, fruit saturated or fruit, the fruit intensity, we're, we're looking for more balance in our wines, more fruit, food friendly wines. So um, Kian, Kian knows it's like the back of the hand now. So um, he helps us a lot with those selections. Well, and we have a, a ton of foodies on right now. So you said you're looking for food friendly wines. For this Merlot, what are some of your can't miss either foods or dishes that uh, you just can't wait when you start preparing them? Well, you know, I tend to put put Merlot in the same category as Cab in this regard. Uh, you know, maybe you get a little broader palette with, with Merlot because it isn't quite as, um, it doesn't have the tannin structure and whatnot, but man, you can't go wrong with, you know, lamb, um, stewed dishes. Um, for maybe um, for vegetarians, you know, good mushroom, umami mushrooms, um, um, even, even pork maybe. Um, I think it, I, I'm kind of a believer of, it's all in the sauce. <laughs> ah, yep. And, um, the sauce can really bring the um, wine and food together. But um, I, uh, but I think there's a lot of overlap with Merlot and Cab. But you know, maybe Merlot you can go more with the with the lighter meats. Yeah, I, I agree. I was going to say with the Cab, I definitely see some of the heavier meats. Certainly, um, burgers, steaks, uh, ribs, that sort of stuff. Uh, anything. On, on the grill, I think would be fantastic. And I've had your cab and it's amazing. 
And I, I think it, it gets back down to, it's the ingredients. It's just like in, in cooking, if you have fresh ingredients and great ingredients, you're gonna genuinely not screw it up unless you're me. Um, but when you have great vineyard sources, like the one behind me, we're gonna show this uh, in a second. Uh, you're talking about George III, you're talking about Beckstoffer, it, it really makes a difference. And then you have a chef, quote unquote, like Kian, and, and you two just get to sit back and relax. It sounds like a wonderful day job. <laughs> no. We're not complaining. <laughs> There's a lot Not relaxing? Sadly, the wine, wine mistress <laughs> isn't all fun and games. <laughs> so it's it's not all many petties and charcuterie trays and bathrobes and, and bubbles and... Kim Vance, you lied to me. You absolutely. Uh, I do want to show folks where we are talking about. So I, I think it is time to, well, maybe not. Uh, there, I hear, I see people chanting for Google Earth. Um, I do hear the crowd. Oh, who's having chicken pesto? Oh, nice. So those of you that stick with us all the time, you, you know that we focus only at Cellar Angels on Napa and Sonoma. And for us, it's, it's the single greatest wine region in the world because of not only the product that comes off of this special plots of land, but the people crafting it. Uh, and it's also the closest one to us. So, I mean, if I loved Bordeaux, it'd be very expensive travel. But I'm always amazed every single time we drill down deeper and deeper into these counties, Sonoma and Napa, some of the things we find. And, and this week is no different because we, uh, Gene and Larry sourced this from the Oak Knoll AVA. And Oak Knoll is actually one of 18 different AVAs in Napa. And this is Route 29 right here. So you can see Yountville, for those of you like myself that enjoy fine food, it's probably the gastro mecca of the world and has been for quite a few years. The borderline of Oak Knoll is just north of the city of Napa. It's a fairly large AVA. It has about three, 300 plus acres under vines. And their vineyard source is this Beckstoffer vineyard plot right here. Now, and Larry and Jean, you can talk to this as well. This is a big vineyard block. So this is not all your fruit. <laughs> no, 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 no. No. <laughs> so I think you mentioned that you have one row or two rows? The co-op the co-op has two rows. Uh, I think we take, well, we used to take about 10 tons of fruit out of there for the co-op. And, and not everybody uses it. Some people just use it for blending. So, but that's that's a pretty big that's a pretty big amount. That's interesting, and that's very uh, French with regards to you know the, the Napoleonic laws where people used to own two hectares, but then that got bequeathed down to their children, and then their children, and then their children, and pretty soon the family only owns one row, yeah. uh, exactly. or, or or half a row. So that's fascinating that you have two, two rows and it's a vineyard that we know, and we know some other folks that source in here, but, but it's just fascinating how large this vineyard block is on the valley floor. Anything noteworthy about the, the soil types as far as what you're, what you're fond of in there? Yeah, um, well, first of all, um, Oak Knoll is further south in the valley and uh, Merlot does better in, in slightly um, cooler, cooler climate. So um, that, that's a plus right there. Um, it, uh, Merlot also likes um, fertile soil or, or soil that can hold the moisture. And this area, because it's at the foot of the um, Mayakamas Mountains benchland area, it, um, it, it, it um, has quite fertile soil as well. So um, it's kind of a, a really nice site for Merlot. Yeah, you're right. You've got million, millions of years of erosion here that just has all washed onto the valley floor. And so you've got all those different type of soil structures and soil types and, and loam and clay and sand and volcanic uh, and, and very nutrient rich. So I, I, it does produce a very lush, uh, very soft velvety wine that you have in the bottle right now, which is really delicious. Yeah. 
Grayscale, kind of an odd name. So uh, I don't imagine it's because of an aunt or uncle uh, or yep. family member. You didn't take the first name of someone's stepsister combined with the last name of someone's uncle and put them together. So Larry, tell me a little bit about how this name came to be. I'll let Jean tell that story. Jean can tell the story. Well, you know, anyone that's kind of started a new business, it's really hard to come up with a name because how many, I mean, we come up with all these great names and up a winery in New Zealand, you know, English speaking wine region just uses that name and it's importing into the States. Can't use that, can't use that, can't use that. So um, we come from the techno computer technology world. And I was um, at the gym one day and I was listening to a, a podcast and this guy was talking about grayscale, grayscale, grayscale. And I thought, ooh, you know, we, we were kind of searching for a name at this point. And I go, grayscale, I think that would be cool for wine because there is no set recipe for wine, right? It's not black and white. Nope. All shades of gray. And so grayscale is, is the um, term used to describe all the shades of gray between white and black. So I thought, ooh, this, this could work, this could work. And then I, I, while I was at the gym on the treadmill, I came up with this tagline, wine is neither black nor white, it's always shades of gray. And I, it, you know, it really, I, I thought it really, um, really fit. But- That's, go ahead. Oh, but subsequently um, we've been, we've gotten a lot of giggles at the table because well, uh, it was uh, like, late um 2011. 2011 or so you know when i give you say or one of us would say the tagline some people would giggle giggle you know under the breath giggle giggle you know and they were referring to 50 shades of gray right so, <laughs> they, want to know, that. they want to know if the wine was, yeah. ooh, better, was better for sex or something yeah, 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 I, so, I didn't yeah. Know, so, so we had to go through that that whole stage and then it was so funny what three four years ago this this Guy comes up to us and he goes, Grayscale, why'd you choose that? And you know, we go through the whole story and he goes, Do you know it's a skin disease on wine of, or um, Game of Thrones? And I go, No, oh no. <laughs> now we're gonna have to fight the the that for you know the however long Game of Thrones is on. But we we actually took advantage of that a little bit. We once offered um, our wine as the antidote to grayscale. Oh, so I was going to say, I see some product placement opportunities there. Just <laughs> we, we have sold a lot of wine due to the fact of the name Grayscale. So anyway, yeah. but I want everyone to know that Grayscale in Game of Thrones was, they came up with a, a cure for it. It's been cured. So um, we don't need to worry about that anymore, but we'll see what happens next. I, I like Chad Angela has, has suggested a free pair of handcuffs with every case order. I'm not certain. Uh, <laughs> Yes, Chad. <laughs> yes. Chad needs to stick to making wine and leave the marketing to Gene on the treadmill. <laughs> that, that is awesome. You know, one thing we don't often uh, chat about is kind of points and accolades and awards and that sort of thing, because it's, it's really, that's a challenging part of the industry, but it's also, it's there and it's an important part of the industry. And without really, you know, making it the mainstream focus of the winery, you've managed to garner quite a bit of accolades. And, and, and that's really kind of a testament to the whole philosophy. Talk to us a little bit about some of the awards for the Merlot, the CAB, the program, and some of the things you're most proud of over the, over the last 10 or so years. Well, I think the first wine we ever produced was the uh, 2008 uh, Cuvée Blanc. And um, by far, at least, at least as far as we're concerned, the top competition in the country is the San Francisco Chronicle wine competition. It's a really tough panel. And they, it, there are 800, I think, people who submit wines there and it's, it's huge. Uh, and so we submitted it to, to uh, that, that thing. And it was just like, well, gee, I hope they, you know, we, we might win, you know, a bronze medal or something. And sure enough, we get an email and it said, you won best in class. And we go, what? First, first vintage. First vintage, best in class. And we were just floored. And so we kind of, you know, at that point we dust off and go, hey, maybe we can really do something with this. We know what we're doing here. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like <laughs> and next year we should get it again and again and again. 
well, yeah, life isn't that easy. It doesn't work out that yeah. way. Uh, but we've, we've always tried to put our wines in difficult uh, competitions and measure ourselves as to what we're doing. And we've done, we've had some really fine, fine wines. Uh, the 15 Merlot got um, uh, 93 or 94 points from wine enthusiasts. Uh, the 2009 Cab uh, got 96 points from the tastings.com folks in Chicago. Uh, the, the 16 Cab that, that's on the, the website got 95 points from uh, the tastings.com guys. Um, so, I mean, we've done, we've done well with just pretty much all of our wines. Not necessarily every year. You know, you can only do what you're kind of given to work with and you do the best you can. Uh, but yeah, we've been lucky enough to get some really nice awards. And, and, and what is overall case production? We're, really uh, small. We're under 500 cases a year. Uh, and it, it goes up and goes down. Uh, there are a lot of things that go into it. Sometimes there's extra fruit that we can get. Sometimes there's fruit available on the open market and we decide to do that. We did that in 2018 with some stagecoach fruit that we were able to get at a very good price. So we've We've done a kind of our version of a red blend, which we call stage one, and it'll be released probably in another year, year and a half. Um, so we're constantly kind of adjusting what we do and how we want the production to match the sales. Um, and that's kind of what we, we stick with. We don't want to turn into a big company. That's not what we're after. Yeah, I was curious, what, you know, if you could start with the end in mind type of scenario, is there a, a threshold of volume that you would like to get to, or do you want it to be completely dictated by fruit sales and, and what you can, you know, actually move, so to speak, and, and not be stuck with inventory? Yeah, I think we want to stick, we want to stick to what something that we can kind of control and sell. Uh, and we don't want to put so much in that we end up having a big warehouse of wine that we're worried about how we're going to get rid of it and, and uh, that sort of thing. So that's kind of been, been the strategy. And I think uh, it's always challenging, you know, because um, being small, as, as you said, nobody knows who you are, which is one reason why we love Cellar Angels. And in fact, I remember the first time that uh, Denise got in touch with me, uh, we were thrilled. Uh, we'd heard about Cellar Angels. We thought, boy, this would be a great opportunity for us to get to some people outside of California. And it's sort of funny, we have, people who we know, if we put something in Cellar Angels, it's gonna, we see certain names are gonna be there. And there's even some names that uh, have come to Napa and we've visited with them. And, and it's, we really, really, really like working with you. Oh, well, thank you. And the days of coming to Napa are fast approaching. So uh, we're, we're gonna be there uh, un momentito, as my Spanish teacher used to say before I would have to go to the principal's office. But uh, I, I think it's, this is part of one of the fun things for us is introducing people to the small producers. And we've said this for the 11 years that we've been in business. We used to say it when we owned the shop. You know, you can go up and down Route 29 and find any number of wineries, right? Uh, and then your second trip, you get off over the Silverado Trail and, and you start finding some other more of the, I've never heard of that winery. I've never heard of that one either. I'm not, how have I never heard of all these wineries? And then your third trip, you start getting into the hills and meeting people, you know, like the two of you. Uh, that don't produce a lot of wine, you just make exceptional wine. And, and that's where and you talked about the stories about where you get bit. I think that's where the consumer gets bit. Mm -hmm. And and they decide, and you know, Kim Vance had a similar experience where she came out to work at Crush and then decided, hey, I'm chucking it. Let's move from Texas and go make wine. I mean, when you get bit, you get bit hard. Denise and I got bit. We opened up a retail store, found an online wine business because great wine is something to be experienced. Uh, it's, it's not mass produced, it brings people together. You have awesome conversations, great food usually, and we get to slow down and, and listen and talk to each other. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's, it's probably more needed today than ever. So certainly this is, this is our treat, by the way, to be able to introduce folks to you guys. And we can't wait to come out and, and see you again. Um, it's, it's long overdue and we've got a lot of angels that also want to do the same thing and Hans and Caitlin from Colorado it says if you're worried about getting rid of wine you are in the right place on these celebrations. <laughs> I do have a one final poll question and let's see if anybody was paying attention so Jean's love of wine and viticulture began at an early age when she used to play among the vines in the vineyards. What country was this? 
France, Spain, United States, Croatia, none of the above. I don't think there's going to be much spread on, on these answers. We're working on a new feature where people can have fake gambling chips and we can keep a tally of how much they've won and bet on the, on the poll <laughs> questions. We know there would be a lot more uh, activity and then just carry, it's like the, you know, the old church pools. You just carry them over week to week. Uh, we're gonna give this 10 more seconds. This is gonna be very interesting. Uh, and I, then I have another question for you from the audience. Five, four, three, two, one. Now, in the, this is a full disclosure forum at Seller Angels, and no one will be made fun of, but I want to know the names of the people who chose France and the names of the people who chose none of the above. You can just be honest. You can put, put it in the, uh, in the chat. Never. Because <laughs> clearly, some of you were not paying attention. Gene, where did you grow up among the vines? Croatia. <laughs> <laughs> Martin, Martin, the more interesting question is how many miles from where we sit is are those vines? Yeah. No, it's, <laughs> how many miles or how many minutes? Because I think I heard 40 minutes to Napa. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> no, for my dad's vines, it's probably a 10 minute drive. So, um, oh, anyway, geez. United States. Come on, people. All right. So, uh, Jeff and Jane Greasy have a question. How involved are you with Kean in the actual winemaking? Light, medium, or heavy? Medium. Um, we, I mean, we meet and decide what we're going to do. And, and uh, we meet regularly and, and taste the wine and assess what's going on. Uh, we also, uh, when it comes time for crush, we go up and, and uh, work the crush. Um, and usually I'll work more than just our fruit. I'll work some of the other fruit uh, for the co-op. Um, on occasion, we'll do more than that. Um, you know, when we do pump overs or, or um, pressing, I'll be up and, and involved in that. Although the thing about pressing is it's kind of, pressing the wine is sort of a big washing machine and you uh, put the wine kind of into the, into the big bladder and you punch the buttons on the little computer and go away for an hour and a half and it automatically does all the pressing. So you don't have to do anything. So it's kind of, you come on up and participate. We're going to punch in the stuff and spend, spend an hour and a half twiddling our thumb. So we don't do so much there. Um, we're there for bottling and we part, we also work on the bottling line when, when we're there. Um, and, and then we go out and sell it and, and uh, do that as well. Perhaps we're not involved with the day-to-day, -day, you know, barrel uh, topping. No, we're not. That kind of stuff. We're, we're, we're not seller rats doing doing the the kind of grunt. Even though, you know, we don't mind doing it. Yeah. But uh, but anyway. Uh, well, do you get to kind of through the process and and you know when you get out of barrel and get ready for bottle in the, any of the blending and you get to participate in that and kind well, of. Oh, well, okay. we, yeah. No, the blending sessions are one of the really important steps. I mean, I think the importance steps are what's your fruit source what's your barrel regime in your aging uh and what's your blend going to be and then the whole thing of of packaging is important for sales and then lastly uh what do you do with the wine when it's when it's kind of waiting you know it's going through its process and it it takes a while for it to to get through and so you just have to be patient and taste it and continually understand what's going on and of course we're always i, I mean you were talking about key and that like I'm always learning new things in, in different wineries and different uh, things I read. And I usually call them up and I say, okay, Kian, what about this? And, and uh, I have yet to come out and say something where his response is an, oh yeah, you could do that. And if you did that, this would happen and that would happen. So it's always <laughs> kind of a continuing discussion. What's the hardest aspect about being a winery owner in relation to the production side of it? I, I can, I'll take this one, or my, my experience. Wine is a living thing. <laughs> so it is doing this and this and this and this and this. And then eventually, as, as it's a little more mature, it the kind of the bumps, you know, smooth out a little bit. But 
it is a living thing. It is constantly changing. And when we open up some of our young wines, we sometimes say, what's it going to be like today? It's, it's really hard, you know, um, uh, because it's not like, you know, opening a can of beer and beer, the beer is the beer, you know, it's a right. constantly changing thing. And we've gotten, we've gotten used to it, but it's still, it took an adjustment to say, oh no, what's it, what's this going to be? What's this going to be? So that, that's an awesome, I, go ahead. I have a slightly uh, different take. I think I really respect Kian and what he knows how to do and what he does. And I think a winemaker does two things. I think the first thing that he or she does is to establish the standard for how the wine is going to be made how clean you're going to be, what the processes are that you're going to use, how the equipment is going to be put together and work, and how to keep it working when it breaks down or something funny happens. So that's the first thing. Second thing is, what do you do when oops happen? And a, a famous one that everybody runs into at some point is a, is a stuck fermentation. So you right. start the fermentation and it ferments for a while, and all of a sudden it stops. What do you do? And the thing that the education get, that you get both practically and theoretically, it, there are ways to deal with all these problems. And the winemaker knows, okay, that problem, I can use this approach to solve it. And that combination is, is vital to what it takes. And it, it, there's tremendous skill there. And, and I have great respect for it. Well, and it's interesting. And both of you hit upon something that I was going to say and just you got there differently in different paths. And I was gonna say patience and, and, and having that, that patience to just go, oh my gosh, stuck fermentation, what do we do? You know, and just kind of, and then having someone go time out, take a breath, this isn't my first rodeo type of thing, you know, things happen. And, and to your point, Larry, where they've got the, the curriculum background and, you know, the scientific background to balance with the years of wisdom attained from the experience aspect. Uh, and Gene, you are spot on. I forget to mention this to people all the time about how wine is a living, breathing organism and it changes. You know, none of us are the same people we were last year and we certainly aren't the same people that we were in our teenage years and those sorts of things. And, and wine, that's a beautiful aspect of it is that it, it ebbs and flows and changes. And then again, having the patience to appreciate that change and, and not get bent over shape or bent out of shape because it's it's not where you want it to be and stuff. So the two great answers, thanks so much for that question or for those answers, that was outstanding. Anything you want to impart from a wisdom fun standpoint uh, to the audience before we close up shop? Hmm, that's a tough one. Um, hmm. Drink more wine. <laughs> <laughs> You know, they don't have a problem doing that. And, and I will, don't forget everyone that they were kind enough to make some of the Cabernet available. You saw it on the site. Uh, it is, it's, it's a fantastic wine. Both the Merlot and the Cab are just stunning. And, and so I applaud you both on, on what you're able to produce here and thrilled that you took the leap of faith to make that first barrel of Cuvée Blanc and, and you haven't turned back and it, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, next week, by the way, we are having Stephanie Trotter uh, from Trotter 116, and Stephanie is one of 16 children that just has another unbelievable story. Very, very small winery, less production than Gene and Larry. Uh, for those of you, uh, we have some more sip kit, kit announcements coming up, so you'll see those, and don't forget, we're going to be giving you the stopper, and I know some of you think we don't understand what you use a stopper for in wine because you drink the whole wine. I get it. I'm, I'm with you, uh, but uh, Every now and then when we have two or three bottles open, you're going to have this. And I think it's going to be great. We're going to do some deep diving and some educational tastings. And Monday is Martin Luther King Day. Many of you have it off. Sean Manning, how are you doing from Payroll Vault in Colorado? Uh, Martin Luther King had a many, many hundreds of famous sayings. But one that I think is uh, pertinent today is nothing in the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. So uh, let's see if we can acquire some knowledge. Uh, as I always say, take care of one another, be good to one another. Thank you all for your support. It means the world to us as we build this wine community. So cheers, everyone. Have a fantastic weekend. And we'll see you next week. Larry and Jean, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you, Mark. And hi, Denise. Hi, Larry. Bye, Jean. <laughs> Production studio. They're calling you.